So welcome to the Natural History Museum. As of a few weeks ago, we are officially a dues-paying member of the American Alliance of Museums. Um, the Natural History Museum does everything that natural history museums do. So we do exhibitions, we do expeditions. This is our uh, expedition bus, which you'll see parked out in the parking lot here. Um, we'll go to environmental uh, hotspots like uh, live fracking sites, drill rigs in Texas, the Petrocoke Hills in Detroit. So these are all expeditions we have planned for 2015 with scientists, artists, and members of the public. We do educational workshops and public programming. The difference between us and traditional natural history museums is we make a point to include and highlight the social and political forces that shape nature. Um, with this inaugural exhibition, um, we're interrogating the influences that affect the atmospheric climate on Earth, as well as the political and funding climate within museums of science and natural history. These are spaces that are intended for the public. They're public spaces that educate children and um, people about environmental issues and our relationship to nature. Um, and it's very important that we preserve these spaces. These institutions represent um, resources, infrastructure, and ideals that are worth fighting for. And it's for that reason that as an aspect of uh, our project, our Natural History Museum, um, we are critiquing the sponsorship of the fossil fuel industry and folks like the Koch brothers sitting on the boards of museums of natural history and science. Um, that's a slice of it. Um, the, the other piece of it is um, probably best explained through this essay that you can get at the back called Exhibiting the Gaze. It corresponds to the, um, the photography that you see on the walls here. We took pictures at four natural history museums around the eastern seaboard. And what we were really interested in is seeing dioramas or displays as displays recognizing that um, one, most often, man is not included. Man's influence over the environment um, is not uh, put on display. And that seems like an omission. Um, we're interested in uh, what kinds of social and political context is omitted from our representations of nature. Is there a politics to the choice of how we construct our presentations of nature? Is there a politics to the aesthetics? Um, is there a politics to the exclusions um, within those representations? So we've been exploring um, this and a variety of other themes through a series of panels and workshops and performances over the last several weeks. Um, we continue it today with seeing the display, Environmentalism's Ideological Habitat. And our moderator, Astra Taylor, will introduce the panel and our panelists here. Um, I just want to make a couple of announcements. One. Um, our museum closes, this particular um, inaugural exhibition closes next Saturday, October 4th. So we do have two more panels coming up. Um, I'll tell you more about them at the end of this event, but in brief, um, at 1 p.m. next Saturday, Anthropocene, Capitalocene, or Ecology for All with Christian Parenti, Jason Moore, and Razmig Kuchian, moderated by Liza Featherstone. And then ending at a 3.30 panel um, on a forward-thinking note, on the heels of the largest climate march in human history, um, now what? We have a panel called Counter Power for Climate Justice with activists Gopal Dayanani, Eddie Bautista, and Elizabeth Yampier, um, very active organizers within the climate justice movement talking about how we build a global movement for climate justice. Um, if you're interested in hearing more about future programming or want to join an expedition or get involved in the museum, I'm going to go ahead and pass around this sign-in sheet. And I'll also invite you, um, we do not take Koch Brothers funding. We did explore taking Koch Sisters funding. Um, I don't know if you're aware of the Koch Sisters, but they're two um, union activists from different activists who have the last name of Koch and um, are currently on tour. Uh, 
and they were going to come here and present us with a giant $5 check. Um, unfortunately, their schedule uh, got booked, and this stuff uh, didn't, didn't make the cut. Um, but uh, we do rely on the support of folks like you and the Koch sisters um, to the tunes of $5 here, $10 there, whatever you can contribute, there's um, a box at the back. We love that, and then we can um, buy our esteemed panelist drinks afterwards. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to Astra. All right, everyone, welcome to seeing the display, environmentalism's ideological habitat. Um, so the plan here is I'm gonna do a very quick introduction uh, of the overarching theme, and then I will introduce the panelists one by one before they speak. They're gonna speak for about 15 minutes each, and then we can have a Q&A. So uh, jot down some questions if you're so inspired. What we're seeing these days is the disappearance of one habitat, public institutions, and the rise of a new and arguably invasive species, networked digital communications, or as Fred Turner in the lovely lavender shirt puts it in the context of exhibitions, democratic surrounds as a particular mode of display. Institutions, ostensibly civic in nature, taxpayer funded, are being replaced with a commercially driven internet with networks. This is happening against a wider backdrop of economic and environmental disruption. And should it alarm us? Should it alarm us that some kinds of communicative, visual, and discursive habitats are disappearing? And do we have any say or sway over what will emerge in their place? This panel was convened to examine the ways the structure the structures of display, exhibitions, and communication systems influence and shape what we see and what we don't. What elements are naturalized within information architecture and design? What elements are invisibilized? What politics are embedded within these systems and how does power operate in an environment that purports to be decentralized, non-hierarchical, democratic, but that is totally immersive? Who or what is in control in both communications and ecological systems. And finally, to what degree does talking about our communication system as an ecology further mystify and naturalize what is better thought of as a human invention and as an economy? So without further ado, we're going to start things off with Fred Turner. Uh, they have very um, illustrious biographies, so I'm just going <laughs> to read them carefully, one by one here. Fred Turner is an associate professor at Stanford University in the Department of Communications and the, and the author of The Democratic Surround, Multimedia and American Liberalism from World War II to the Psychedelic 60s. And also from counterculture to cyberculture, Stuart Brand, The Whole Earth Network and The Rise of Digital Utopianism. And I strongly recommend reading both these books. I think they're really excellent, um, very influential. Uh, there's a third book. Echoes of Combat, Trauma, Memory, and the Vietnam War. Before joining Stanford, Turner taught communication at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He earned a BA in English and American Literature from Brown University and an MA in English from Columbia University and a PhD in communication from the University of California, San Diego. Before joining academia, Turner worked as a journalist for over 10 years, writing for the Boston Phoenix and Boston Sunday Globe, among others. Um, so without further ado, Fred, and then I'll introduce the next folks. Thank you, Esther. Oh, thanks, yep, great. We have slides. Great, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, does it work if I move around a little bit, or, or do, I, do I need to stay right here, Paul? Oh, great. I can, I can do my Oprah thing. That'll be good. All right, thanks. Okay, let me go. Whoa, we've gone into auto slideshow mode. Let's see. There we go. I think we're back. We're back here. We're close enough. Good. That's fine. All right. Um, thank you, Astra. And thank you um, for having me here. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Becca. Um, thank you, group. I feel really, really lucky to be here. Um, as those of you who write books may know, um, you spend a lot of time alone in your room, and when folks find them useful when you leave your room, it's just thrilling. 
so thank you. <laughs> um, this is a little loud, so maybe I'll go back up here after all. Just tuck that there. Okay, so what I want to do today is I want to actually take you back to a moment in which the kind of environment that we're sitting in today in part gets invented. It's a moment in the 1940s when, to give you the story in a nutshell, there is a terrible fear that mass media, film, newspapers, will literally turn us into fascists. And if we're going to avoid that fate, which seems to have already befallen Germany and Italy and Japan, remember this is 1941, we've got to develop modes of display, modes of arranging our visual and sonic life in such a way that we get to practice the skills on which democracy depends. The fate of the nation quite literally depends, for many people in this period, on the way that we organize our aesthetics and through them our perception of what it means to be a citizen. And that's the story I'm going to tell today. I'm going to start actually with our own moment. We inhabit a moment in which we are surrounded by screens. Not necessarily in a benevolent way. We are asked to um, act as individuals, to imagine ourselves as individuals, connecting, I hate that word, connecting with others through the screens, but we're working in a world that's highly managed for us. One in which the choices that we have, which feel like many, are actually created for us. It's like living in a giant supermarket. And I want to talk a little bit about where that world came from today. I want to take us back to a moment that's been long forgotten, but that was extraordinarily influential. In 1938, America faced a problem. The problem went something like this. We looked overseas, and we looked particularly at Germany. Germany, until that moment, despite World War I, was the model of high culture for America. We had Beethoven. We had any number of thinkers. We had poets, Heine and the groups. Germany was what we looked for European high culture as. So how was it, we got to wondering, that they had fallen for this crazy mustachioed dictator? How did this most cultured nation of Europe turn fascist? And there's an awful lot of speculation about it, but much of that speculation among journalists, um, academics, and government officials boiled down to this. Hitler had mastered the media. And there was something about mass media in particular that caused you to turn authoritarian. So there are two theories of how this worked. One theory was that your senses were literally like receivers. Um, they were gateways to your unconscious. Now, Americans had known about Freud for about 20 years at this point. That was exciting. That was like a little revenge of the repressed. Um, so, so they'd known about Freud for a little while. And that one fear was that madmen like Hitler had been able to transmit their madness down the pipes of the media through your eyes and ears into your unconscious, causing you to somehow subconsciously bond with them. That's theory one. That's out there. Theory two is that simply being in a mass audience, tuning your senses together in the direction of a single source, was an opportunity to practice the perceptions on which fascism depended. You were literally practicing turning yourself off, turning yourself into a member of the mass and aiming yourself toward a single leader. Um, you can get a feel for this, I think, in that picture there from the Rural Electrical, uh, uh, Electrification Administration. Notice how radio has this tremendous power to beam toward your house, to penetrate your house, to penetrate your mind. People were very afraid that people like Hermann Goering could transmit their madness that way. They were also afraid that FDR could do that. We remember FDR, particularly in the wake of the ubiquitous and iniquitous Ken Burns, um, as a warm kind of paternal figure. Um, in his own time, he was frequently referred to in the mainstream press as, to my own shock, the fourth fascist. And there was a terrible fear that he had the ability, through his radio fireside chats, to penetrate our minds and cause us to buy into the centralization and massification of the American state, i.e. the New Deal. Now, the fear that mass media could turn Americans fascist was not unwarranted given what was actually going on at the time. We've forgotten it today, but fascism was a real possibility in the United States in the late 30s and early 40s. I was astonished. I, I never knew about this. Maybe you all did. I was astonished to see that in 1939, 22,000 Americans rallied in Madison Square Garden on behalf of fascism. They had a giant banner hanging from the ceiling that said, Stop Jewish Domination of Christian America. You may not know, I certainly didn't, that there were fascist summer camps on Long Island in the late 30s, early 40s. My personal favorite is Camp Siegfried. Um, at Camp Siegfried, you could dress up like a Nazi, a German Nazi. These are very Germanic. A uh, German Nazi, your children would learn the proper salute. 
Um, this was all covered in Life magazine. Um, you may not remember Father Coughlin, um, a sort of very right-wing radio personality. Uh, pro promoted the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a Nazi tract. Um, a Gallup poll in 1939 showed that on, in any given week, 65% uh, of his audience agreed with his pro-fascist conclusions. Um, finally, Humphrey Bogart. You all probably know him from Casablanca, yes? Okay. I bet you probably haven't seen a movie called The Black Legion. 1937, Humphrey Bogart played an American fascist who murders his Polish neighbor and regrets it. He's part of a secret group called the Black Legion, American Black Shirts. Um, it's, it's a, it, people were very, very scared. As Sinclair Lewis said, it could happen here. So the question is, how, as World War II starts, do we do propaganda to stir our own people to resist fascism without turning them into fascists? And two answers emerge. Um, I'll come to that in a minute. Um, they, they emerge primarily with a group called the Committee for National Morale. And it has kind of a, 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 an odd feel to us now, but the Committee for National Morale was 60 of America's leading social scientists, people like Margaret Mead from the American Museum of Natural History, um, Gregory Bateson, um, Ladislaus Farrago, a whole series of folks. And they get together and they want to formulate a new understanding of media. And they want to formulate it around what they take to be a particular mode of personality. You all may have heard of Adorno's notion of the authoritarian personality. That notion was created and promulgated against another notion that we've lost track of historically, and that was the democratic personality. As powerful and as popular in its time as the, as the authoritarian was. And the people on the Committee for National Morale believed that American unity had to be made up of people who were individually psychologically whole, able to choose to be together, and their strength, in turn, would come from choosing to be together. And this, in distinction to the authoritarian, massified, unthinking, crazed fascists of Germany. Here's Gordon Allport, um, a member of the Committee for National Morale, a psychology professor at Harvard. He says, in a democracy, every personality can be a citadel of resistance to tyranny. In the coordination of the intelligences and wills of 100 million whole men and women lies the formula for an invincible American morale. There are two words here that I want us to, to pay a lot of attention to. The first is personality. Personality is key here. The source of resistance to fascist predation is inside you. It's your personality. Second, the mode of organizing yourselves has to be coordination, not hierarchy, not bureaucracy. I hope you're starting to feel hints of Facebook here, a world built around personality and coordination of personalities, because that's where we're headed over the long haul. So the, the men and women of the Committee for National Morale were social scientists. They were not really media designers. They did actually design a whole multimedia uh, building for the Museum of Modern Art that was never built. It was just terrible, just bad in every way. Um, but they also knew people who were multimedia designers. They knew Bauhaus refugees, most notably Herbert Beyer, who had come over here in 1937. And they brought with them the Bauhaus theories of multi-screen display that were enormously powerful and that had been developed for other reasons entirely. In the 1920s, members of the Bauhaus in Germany hoped to develop multi-screen arrays to give people the experience of choosing meaningful images from around themselves so as to resist the chaos of the Weimar era world, the chaos of industrialism, of capitalism. It was a very radical social vision. When the Bauhaus artists came to the United States, they were unemployed. Radicalism kind of went out the window they were more than happy to offer up this multimedia structure as a democratic, a pro-democratic structure. It was a structure for producing democratic people. These two worlds, the worlds of the sociologists who were theorizing democratic personality and the worlds of the Bauhaus artists who were developing multi-screen worlds, came together in propaganda exhibitions at the Museum of Modern Art. And this is the first place it happened, The Road to Victory, 1942, incredible show. Um, to us today, you know, the idea of big pictures like this, floor-length imagery, might not seem so strange. To the people who saw the show at the time, enormously powerful. They couldn't believe how strange it was to see images of different sizes. We might also balk a little bit, I think, at the race politics here. Um, those three men in the front were called red men um, at the front of the exhibition. That would certainly bother us today. Um, but for people who saw the show, it was a big, big deal. I actually want to read you a, a quotation from someone who saw the show. Um, 
80,000 people saw the show in the first three months that it was open, and they were simply blown away. Uh, the New York Times critic says, I think no one can see the exhibition without feeling that he is part of the power of America. A critic from the Springfield Sunday Union Republican wrote, and this is one I love best, Road to Victory does not mold the visitor's opinions, for that word smacks of fascism, the fascist concept of dominating men's minds. For people who saw this show in 1942, the surround vision looked like one that made it possible to be totally yourself, totally in control of your perceptual experiences, while also being together with others like yourself. It looked like a chance to practice the psychological conditions of democracy. It was also a space in which people were mobile. They could move. Now, we see a road there, and that might look very controlling. But to people in this time frame, it was very, very different. It felt very free. In, you know, traditionally, museum shows at this time were just image, image, image at eye level. You went image, experience, image, experience. This idea of being free to move through an environment constructed for you, very new, very powerful. So the book tells the story of how this form migrates through time. And it migrates two ways. And they're, they're, they're each really wild. Across the 1950s, this multimedia form becomes America's leading propaganda tool. We take it overseas, and we attempt to commit what the United States Information Agency theorized as therapy on non-democratic peoples. Um, the first place this is tried is actually Afghanistan, 1956. We stage exhibitions in which we hope they will be democratized by their encounter with multimedia. And we then have USIA psychologists testing visitors to see if that has, in fact, worked. Um, this continues all the way up into the 1960s. The other place this aesthetic travels is into the art world, particularly through the Bauhaus workers into John Cage's sound experiments, into um, Black Mountain College, and through that, directly into the happenings of the early 1960s and the 60s counterculture. Um, the book goes into this in great detail, and I won't. All I want to say for here is the world of art and the world of propaganda are not and have never been as unentangled as we've tended to think they were. Okay. So I want to conclude by making, making one argument. In the 1940s, this mode of display that I'm calling the democratic surround was a powerful alternative to fascist modes of media making. And people perceived it as enormously liberating. But it also marked, I think, the emergence of a managerial mode of power that dominates our lives today. In that managerial mode, okay, so we're not being shouted at by Hermann Goering, and we're free to move inside a space like this, but behind the walls, there's a backstage. This world has been built for us by invisible others with whom we can't communicate, whose selections we cannot change. And that's where I think we live now. I think we inhabit a world in which our perceptions are a subject of extraordinary political effort by interested parties, and in which thinking about perception is something that we need to think about the same way that we think about politics, because perception is a part of politics. And let me say, that's why I'm so excited by the images that surround us today. We have images around us that reflect not only on some invisible, unique nature, but on our encounter with nature as itself deeply politicized. So um, that's where we are, and I thank you for having me. Okay, next up we have Peter Anker, who is a historian of environmental sciences, specializing in the history of ecology and ecological architecture and design. Anker is currently an associate professor at the Gallatin School of Individualized Study and the Environmental Studies Program at New York University. Anker has received research fellowships from the Fulbright Program, the Dibner Institute, and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, and has been a visiting scholar at both Columbia University and the University of Oslo. 
He's the author of From Bauhaus to Eco House, A History of Ecological Design, which explores the intersection of architecture and ecological science, and also Imperial Ecology, Environmental Order in the British Empire, 1895 through 1945, which investigates how the promising new science of ecology flourished in the British Empire. I'm also thinking I saw you in the uh, Adam Curtis documentary, did I not? Yeah. Okay, which is, uh, I'll watch over by Machines of Loving Grace, I believe. So I thought I had met him before and I realized I've only seen him on the internet. <laughs> All right. Hey, thank you for coming. It's, uh, it's beautiful weather outside, so it's really an honor for me that you guys are here inside. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you through one of my sort of strange experiences of life. And as I came to America from Norway, and for me that was like coming to, I don't know, some sort of strange tribe in Borneo or something. Uh, and I immediately came into the sort of mood of being the anthropologist when I came upon the work of Thoreau. Uh, so I had never read Thoreau before. I never, you know, bothered about him. And I read Walden. I thought it was a tremendously boring book. Um, but I had to read it because everyone read it. And it was part of the syllabus, right? So, uh, and I had to teach this syllabus. So for that reason, I had to sort of get into the mood and get excited about it. So now I'm working on, uh, this is going to be a chapter hopefully in the book, although I don't really know what to do with it. I need your help uh, 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 to go on with it. And the reason why I want to talk about Thoreau is that he has very much to do with the problems this exhibition tries to address, namely the ideological uh, backdropping of environmentalism and natural history museum. Now, I want to extend it uh, in the sense that I think uh, uh, the nature we have outside often reflects the way we think about nature inside and vice versa, obviously. So um, I want to take you to Walden, and I think that, that little lake, um, in many ways, is also as constructed ideologically and physically as natural history museums inside. And that's kind of one of the points I want to show you. All right, so here's my man. Um, he, uh, 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 and here, this is the cottage that I'm going to take an interest in. Uh, architecturally, in my opinion, like, very b boring. Um, uh, and uh, I was always wondering why, why do people find this book so interesting? Now, notice right away that the cottage, the architecture, is right in the front page of the book. This is a book about wilderness, about nature, about the environment, yet the very, very uh, center of humanity, if you like, namely house, place to live, is the symbol of a book about wilderness or about nature, or about exploring nature. Well, that, I think, is actually a paradox that I want to explore in, my, in the following minutes. So I decided to uh, take a ride and go up and visit this place. And now I'm going to take you with my ride. Um, notice that this type of environment here, this is where I got lost, even though I had all the gadgets not to get lost. I had that sense of being uh, you know, lost uh, in wilderness, if you like. If you notice, could you say where, the, where this is? It could be anywhere, right? This is the type of environment we are getting lost in today. Um, where am I? There's no really cultural references or natural references. Uh, and I think, to, to flash up one of my points, this is as close to wilderness we get uh, today in the environment. For, look, we're getting up into Walden, closer to Walden. This is you know, still sort of unfamiliar territory. And here we get the first sign of getting into to a constructed nature, namely the biker. All right? The biker who's out there for a leisure sports uh, bike ride, uh, clearly a sign of sport, a sign of a place where you can do physical exercise. And here's the walker. Uh, they have these kind of strange tasks with water there in the back. Um, uh, uh, again, a sign of us entering a place where sports activities are taking place. Now, if you've driven a lot around in American environments, which I haven't, but I've driven enough to see that walkers and bikers are actually rare people to see. Very rare to see people walking around in American roads. So this is something very special is happening here. And that's what we're calling out to the Walden Pond Reservation. Now, notice right away the signposting. Uh, as if you were entering a museum, entering a place of significance, a place of you know, being inside, outside. Indeed, we have to pay to get inside this place um, at the parking lot. Um, the parking lot is the first thing that greets you when you come to this, uh, uh, this, uh, to this place, a place which you can, in the books, travel by road, uh, by rail, but in fact, everyone is coming by car. 
um, that is, you're polluting your way to experience uh, um, the, uh, the natural environment. Um, here, again, signposts of natural, um, uh, natural history displays. You see them. Um, you will see that there is here a display of uh, uh, of, you know what to do, not to do. There's a garbage. There's information about the lake. There's you know uh, basically ecologist telling you uh, about what you are going to experience. That is the place is taken totally over by the natural scientist, the ecologist. This is their place. This is there where they can empower themselves at uh, uh, at your pleasure or expense, depending how you see it. There's a statue of Thoreau. Um, with kids, and here's a replication of his hut. Um, it's not at the location where he lived, it's by the parking lot, but it's supposed to give you a sense of what it was like. You enter this place, to me a very mundane place, fireplace, a bed, and a desk, um, uh, and you go in and you do, you, descri you scribe your name into the Thoreau heritage. All right? You put in your name, I've been here, there's some uh, uh, displays of uh, Elliot Porter uh, show in a, in a neighborhood, you know, is in, uh, art or nature photography. Art, nature photography is kind of, you know, borderline with him. Um, you go to the shop, um, this is where you buy the Thoreau teddy, uh, the Thoreau little animal, the, all the things that you, you know, that you associate with reading his book, uh, uh, and you buy this, this sort of stuff. Now, Notice that here, suddenly, this landscape looks as if it's pristine, untouched. Uh, it gives you a sense of being out there in the wild. It's not a sign of human activity. Uh, it's, uh, uh, to, uh, to, according to certain aesthetic, it's a beautiful environment and very untouched. Similarly here, this is a more of a summer uh, uh, display, uh, postcards that you can sign up and send, I have been there. All right, postcard is a bit passé, but you know, some people still do it. Uh, I guess today it will be like a Facebook or something. Right. Another one, um, very, uh, uh, there's, there's almost no human activity. Notice that there is a little house here in the background. You can get, turn to that in a second. Uh, otherwise, very untouched. Now, these type of postcards uh, of the untouched environment, it's nothing new. This is from 100 years ago, still these type of of cards displaying that this is a pristine place. Now, when we uh, walk in, it's nothing but pristine. Everything is amusement, entertainment, ice cream in this case, um, family-oriented. Uh, uh, the idea that this is a place you go to uh, to entertain yourself, do your sport. Although it's not really a, a jogging place, that's more like uh, the big around in the in the, the Walden. It's a walking place, and, and when you enter. There is all these regulations. Park closes, park opens. These things are prohibited. Pets, uh, uh, alcohol, bikes, etc. And there is a gate here saying when you can open, when you can go in, when you get out. All the same type of um, signals of, of, uh, of power uh, and of uh, what's allowed, what's al not, not allowed. Um, that you would see in a regular museum like a natural history museum. Indeed, I don't see much of a difference, except right here you can walk in for free, you don't have to pay. Um, so you walk in and you see there's, um, uh, there's a, again, the information display uh, by uh, the scientists telling them what they are doing here. All right? So what they're doing here is that they are doing something called ecological restoration uh, or ecological design. It's a, different sort of names, uh, not meaning fine design as in furniture or architecture, but as in designing or restoring the environment. Designing meaning more in the direction of giving um, um, the environment a, a, a certain uh, look that you would appreciate, say garden design, while a restoration mean more that you should uh, try to uh, rebuild the ecology of the past. Right? Try to restore the environment that was once there. Pause for thought. Right? right there, there is a sense of, uh, 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 just to speak to today's theme, ideology. Right? So the environment that was once there, that is the natural environment of the American heritage, uh, of, uh, of the environment that you take pride in. Uh, and that's what they're doing. Um, in order to do that, though, they have to 
Um, you walk down here, you have to put up fences where you can walk. You can't walk, so if you walk on this environment, it'll be, uh, it, it will damage the, the grass. So you, they put up, so you have only one like to walk here. Um, help uh, fight erosion, please stay on paths, etc. Um, uh, the, the place is, is uh, physically regulated. Um, now, this is, this is, these type of attempts is nothing new. At, well, at, at Thoreau's one time, they also de did these type of scientific investigations uh, to the area. It's been scientists have been involved there for now 150 years. So that's, in a way, nothing new. Uh, uh, it's a very popular place for science, uh, given the fact that Boston is... Uh, the hub, perhaps in America, for scientific research, and this is a short railroad stop for the scientist. You go off and you can go for the path and you can do re uh, research. So there's a very uh, you know, long history of research at the Walden. All right, so danger, unguarded water area. This is in the place of, of wilderness. You know, again, a kind of sign of wilderness, yet it has this sort of beach uh, thing to it. Um, now, what you think that this once at the time was untouched, but it was not. This is a picture taken about 20 years after Thoreau lived there, but actually also reflects five minutes left, the time when he was there. So there's been a sort of ecotourism going to the place for the longest time. Here is a photo taken uh, 35 years after Thoreau lived there. Bathers, uh, things, you know, this is a hectic activity for, uh, for, for social fun. To speed up now because we're running out of time. Um, again, we see uh, the, there's something called the social construction of the environment, but that's not what I'm arguing here. I'm talking about the natural construction of an environment. Um, look here, they're putting out these, these uh, 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 kind of carpets in order to make sure that grass is going to grow on it. Um, that's a, a physical construction of, of the environment. Um, and the same you'll see in the next slide, putting out this natural carpet to stop soil erosion, make sure that this place will look as natural as possible when, you know, when that's done uh, and they will make sure people don't walk there to make it look nice. Um, so this is where Thoreau once lived. This is where the cottage is and you put this up here and, uh, and I went up there, I heard these rumors from my students that there were all kind of counter, you know, strange cultures happening here uh, 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 at various days of the year, apparently on midsummer night. Um, I heard that there were, you know, strange events happening, so I went up there to check it out. And yes, indeed, in the middle of the night, I went up there, and there were people who undressed, there were people holding hands naked to celebrate and pray to Mother Earth, there were people swimming in the pond. There were all kind of strange and wonderful, exotic uh, events happening, celebrating uh, nature in a place they associated with the, with the birth of environmentalism. And I mentioned that uh, because for me it's a sign of, of this place having uh, um, an ideological, if you like, um, uh, uh, birth of, of, of the environmentalism. If you go to um, lots of the uh, 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 literature on the environmental debates, say uh, Donald Worcester's book, Nature's Economy, uh, many other books about uh, the history of environmentalism, you see that he starts, or these books starts with Walden. That's where it all began. This is the place of origin. Um, and places of origin uh, in terms of environmental concern, I, I don't agree with that. I mean, actually, in Europe, we don't start with Thoreau, we start with Rousseau. Uh, but it's a very similar debate about with Rousseau in Europe or in Norway, where I'm from. We all have our local heroes, right? So here is the local hero is, is Thoreau. Um, uh, and that's why this type of environment becomes so important. That's why we have the ecologists, the natural scientists, uh, make, making sure that this environment is going to look just as it did when Thoreau was there, because that's the point, um, uh, the ground zero, so to speak, for environmental concern. If we can just restore the environment back to how Thoreau once had it, then we have saved uh, uh, this symbol uh, two minutes uh, for, uh, from the um, problems of, um, uh, the, from our environmental problems. Meaning, uh, and that, this is where, what I think is, is, is fascinating, uh, the protection of Walden um, has to do, of course, with protecting that little environment, but much more so with trying to protect um, uh, the ideological purity of 
the environmental uh, uh, in, of environmentalism in uh, in America, with recreating and uh, this environment as. Uh, uh, in the way it once was. So when you visit there, you, it is as if you're visiting your, uh, the nation's origin, as if you come to that primal rock and you step around Walden and say, this is how it once was, and we have restored it, uh, we have saved it, uh, we have in that way also saved America. That was a good punchline. Thank you. I had to remove my prop hat because my head was too hot. Um, Jody Dean is the bomb. It says that in her bio right here. She teaches media and political theory and is the Donald R. Harder 39 Professor of Humanities and Social Sciences at Hobart and William Smith Colleges. She is currently a fellow at the Society for the Humanities at Cornell University. She has written seven books, including Solidarity of Strangers, Aliens in America, Publicity's Secret, Zizek's Politics, Democracy and Other Neoliberal Fantasies, Blog Theory, Feedback and Capture in the Circuits of Drive, and lastly, The Communist Horizon. She edited Feminism and the New Democracy, uh, and also Cultural Studies and Political Theory with Paul A. Passavant, um, who may be in the audience, um, and also Empire's New Clothes, Reading Heart and Negri. Um, and lastly, she also co-edited Reformatting Politics, Information, Technology, and Global Civil Society. So without further ado, the busy lady, Jody Dean. Um, I don't care. I just want to be able to put this down without like breaking the computer. Great. Thanks, folks, for coming out and for, um, yeah, for staying in, actually, during while well, it's so um, nice out. Um, I'm going to keep with our thematic of talking about the present um, ideological formation that we're in or our communicative environment. And I'm going to talk about it with the idea of communicative capitalism. And what I'll do is explain what I mean by communicative capitalism. I'll describe some of its basic features, some of the repercussions of it, and then um, you know, what is to be done next, or how we might approach um, how we might approach left climate politics given our current ideological and communicative environment. Okay. So first, um, what is communicative capitalism? I use that term to designate the convergence of democracy and capitalism such that democracy loses any critical capacity it might have had. In communicative capitalism, democratic ideals of equal access, inclusion, and participation are realized, right, it's not a fantasy, right, they're really realized, but they're realized through the expansion and intensification of global and ubiquitous personalized media. So people participate by you know, registering their opinions, by um, being included in ever more networks. So these are real active practices, but these are practices that actually enhance and intensify capitalism. Capitalism expropriates our basic communicative practices, encouraging them, right? Asking us, oh, please register your opinion. Please let us know where your location is. Please upload all of your stuff, right? So capitalism expropriates our basic communicative practices, encouraging them and treating them as its own private resource. So democratic ideals are those that tell us everyone should participate, everyone should get involved, everyone should have their voices heard. Um, cap, um, demo democracy tells us, oh, you know, expression and uh, discussion are really, really good. These are what matter apart from the content, right? The content is sort of pushed aside as long as everyone expresses herself or himself, as long as there's a good discussion. 
Communicative capitalism agrees with democracy on this and provides a wide array of means and opportunities for us to discuss, express ourselves, and be involved. And then it claims all of our content, our data, and our metadata as its own. It even claims our own associations with one another, our networks, as its own. Okay, so that's now just the general description of communicative capitalism, so that you'll have an idea of like what, you know, what does the concept um, designate. I now want to mention three basic features of communicative capitalism, and first I'll list them and then I'll, I'll describe them. So the first is a shift from message to contribution. Second will be the intrinsic inequality of networks. And third, um, a kind of technical thing, which I'll try to explain, called the decline of symbolic efficiency. Okay, so first, under communicative capitalism, our basic communicative messages turn into contributions. This means that now when we send messages to people, whether it you know, doesn't really matter exactly what the medium is, the messages are sent less with the expectation that someone's going to really ponder them and understand them or really will take their content seriously. Rather, the idea is like, oh, someone will just get the message and either register, yes, got it, didn't get it, and then forward it or share it um, or you know, like it or something like that. So instead of having messages that are kind of ideas where the content matters, we have contributions to a kind of swirling communicative flow, right? a kind of stream of inputs where it doesn't really matter what the content is, something can be um, true or false, as long as it just is another contribution to the stream. All contributions, or let me say this differently, each contribution is equal to any other. So it doesn't matter if it's true or false, right? In a headline can be anything, right? The response can be anything. Uh, it can be a rebuttal, it can be ironic, it can be a joke, it doesn't matter. Each one as a single communicative contribution is equal to any other. So you can think about this with respect to something like you know, responses on Facebook. You know, what you usually do is just count them. Oh my God, like 45 people said something here, but it doesn't matter if half the people said you're an idiot, right? All of, you know, it doesn't matter if they were you know, supportive it's just the number of them that counts. Each one is a communicatively equivalent contribution. Okay, so that's this first idea, that uh, first feature of communicative capitalism, the shift from a message to contribution. Second, um, the second is the way that complex networks generate inequality. So think about it like this. Um, Book, each book is not equal to any other book, right? Some books are blockbusters, right? Something by Stephen King, huge bestseller. Um, and then other books are small books from university presses that you're lucky if 300 people read, read, right? So just because there's a book published, it doesn't really mean anything. A whole bunch of people will ignore it, a few might read it, or it can be this very rare blockbuster. The same's the case with any song right, with any post, with any article, right, having an article with, um, or a movie or a song doesn't really matter because they can, they, the way they're going to circulate is actually going to generate extreme inequality. So the first thing, so I've first talked about how the utterances are equal, now I'm going to switch it and talk about how they're unequal. So, um, so I was, uh, was mentioning this business about how some books are blockbusters, um, bestsellers, and some are obscure. Why is this the case? There's a, what, they, what um, Albert Laszlo Barabasi has called the 80-20 rule, or the power law shape of complex networks. And the basic idea, or another way it's put in popular media, is the winner-take-all or winner take most characteristic of complex networks. So the basic idea is that the bigger the pool, the larger the inequality. So the more books written, the larger the difference between the bestseller and the little obscure book. Another way to think about the same idea is with, like, if you're on Twitter, your number of followers versus Lady Gaga's number of followers, right? So there's the more and more people in a network, the greater the difference between the most popular one and the long tail of all the little ones. So lots of people might have 100 or 200 followers, and then fewer and fewer have 20,000, 100,000, 
millions, you know, 10, 20, 30 million. All complex networks have this kind of structure. Now, I can go into the details about that, but um, I'll do that in the Q&A rather than explain exactly why this is the case. But the thing to think about is that as networks grow, the more participants, the more um, the different, the larger the difference between the top and the bottom. And oh, another good example of this, lotteries, right? You know, everybody wants um, in a lottery, um, but the more people that go in it, the, least, the less likely your chance of winning is, even as, even as the um, amount of the winnings increases. Third characteristic of, of communicative capitalism, the decline of symbolic efficiency. So this idea comes from the philosopher Slavoj Žižek. First, symbolic efficiency refers to the way a symbol can mean the same thing in different contexts, right? So if someone is wearing a cross, that means the same thing if it, so a cross um, that a rock star is wearing around her neck means the same thing as a cross in a church. We all know that a cross is this kind of Christian image that it's associated with um, Christian figures. It doesn't really matter where it's set. So that's symbolic efficiency. These days, fewer and fewer symbols are efficient. So some symbols, like say traffic signs or construction signs, those are really efficient, right? They mean the same thing pretty much wherever you are. You don't get into some big thing like, oh my God, I don't understand this caution tape, right? That it's, it is symbolically efficient. But more and more other ideas and symbols and images aren't efficient. You don't know what they mean beyond their context. Um, yesterday, Stuart Ewan gave some great examples of this um, with respect to climate politics, namely words like clean energy or what something being green or sustainable or renewable or a secure energy future. These terms actually are really unstable. They're not symbolically efficient. They're really, they're contested, they're mobile. We can be suspicious of them, but we don't know for sure if someone says, oh, well, this is a green this. It's like, really? Like, what, what does that mean? How do we know? Another way to think about this general concept or this general idea of the decline of symbolic efficiency is in terms of a more general fragmentation of the symbolic order. Um, for example, you might experience this in groups where people are having a hard time finding a common language to describe what they want to do or what their goals are or how they understand a situation. And there can be a lot of struggle, oh God, okay, um, over, you know, over what, the, what basic ideas mean. Um, another thing, it, like when people say stuff like, you know, 40 is the new 60, it's like, really? What does 40 mean in that context? Context. What does 60 mean in that context? So this, um, this change lets us know that these symbols don't have the same meaning that they might have. In um, psychoanalysis, this symbolic position um, is talked about with respect to um, the ego ideal, and it means the perspective we take toward ourselves that lets us see ourselves as doing things that are admirable. For, you know, um, one example would be like, you know, the good communist, right? A good communist would be able to answer, what did I do for the revolution? And the ego ideal would be the communist party, you know, saying that to whom one might have to answer. But if this perspective is crumbled, if we can't take a perspective towards ourselves and what we're doing, then we don't really know how to evaluate our actions. Have we done you know, appropriate good political things? Have we been kind of you know, useless waste of lives? What does it mean for something to be admirable? We don't know the perspective from which we're looking. Okay, so what are the repercussions then of these attributes of communicative capitalism? First, including more opinions and voices adds to the communicative flow, which amplifies inequality, right? The more inputs, the bigger the field, the larger the, different, the, larger the um, difference between the one and the many. So what happens then when we add to the communicative flow, like writing another book, writing another article, is we either add to an idea or theme that's already strong, or we add just some other little new thing which increases the difference between what is big and popular and what is small and little. So weirdly, more participation, more information, and more opinions is more 
inequality in this commu communicative field. A second repercussion, critique loses its efficacy. It's just another contribution. The content doesn't matter. In fact, in, um, we notice in real-time networks, sometimes the critique even precedes that which it is critiquing. Right? So critique can happen even before what it's supposed to be criticizing. Um, a third repercussion, um, the emphasis on making your own choice or finding out for yourself and expressing your own individual perspective fails to serve emancipatory egalitarian energies, but in fact supports communicative capitalism because the idea is that each little contribution is as important as any other and that you're supposed to do it without any kind of symbolic structure that lets you know is what you're doing valuable, useful, appropriate or not. So we've got this kind of dilemma where we are told to find information um, compelled to choose um, even when we have no perspective from which to um, basically associate, um, no perspective from which to assess our choices. In the absence of a kind of external um, symbolic perspective, capitalism fills in the gaps so that we end up evaluating our choices and our actions in capitalist terms, like was that efficient? Was, is that going to be a good investment? Was, that worth, was it worth your time? Um, is that profitable? You see this a lot now in higher education where was that a good return on your investment? So what is to be done then? Um, got, you know, three possibilities or three suggestions for where we might go or what this might add in, how we might kind of, um, we can't get out of it completely but try to cut through this problem of communicative capitalism. One, don't add new things. Um, instead, seize what is already there. Right? You can, we, you, you can use it during, with occupation, occupying institutions. Um, camouflage, right? Camouflaging intentions and infiltrating institutions. Um, using generic materials and reappropriating them. So the idea would be, uh, um, take what is already available rather than trying to add in a bunch of new possibilities. And I, I think that this occurs a lot in, um, I, I find this in um, discussions of left politics where people are always like, oh, we have to have new forms, we have to have new this, we have to have new that. I actually think that's a capitalist mentality, like a new brand, the next new thing. Um, and instead what's better is to seize and reappropriate what's there. Two other um, um, suggestions. Emphasize collectivity over individuality. The strength comes through numbers. A group is more than the sum of its parts. So rather than encouraging each individual perspective, cultivate and enhance um, larger group perspectives. And then third, institutions. Um, institutions provide perspectives from which to see. Right? These are perspectives that can endure over a long struggle. Um, they cut through a bunch, a variety of different things to say, no, this institution is a perspective on this area. It collects ideas and possibilities in this area. It's not meant to be everything to all people. It is a specific perspective. So I would, again, emphasize as a way to cut through communicative capitalism, um, seizing what is there rather than adding new things, emphasizing collectivity over individuality, and turning to institutions, whether or not that is um, occupying them from, or changing from them from within, but recognizing that they can endure in a time of ultimately um, incohesion and flow. Thank you. All right, thank you panelists. Um, I have a few questions in my pocket if nobody else has some, but we can also open this up and let you participate in this democratic surround if you would like. So anybody, something to add? Okay, why don't you throw yours? Um, oh, okay, wow. Jody, um, I was at the uh, climate change march and um, 
based on something you were talking about, I've had the interesting experience for me in, in, in microcosm was that groups of people, or particular groups, uh, wanted to go off and decide what their chant would be for that day. They had to go and come up with the right chant. And it, it kind of uh, speaks to what you were talking about, about f you know, adding to the, the dialogue and adding more and more. So uh, as I reflected during your talk, I guess I, my question for you is, do you have suggestions for that movement so that they can crystallize their thinking into uh, something that will enable them to move uh, forward from what happened uh, last week? Um, is this on now? Yeah. Um, that's a, that's a, that's, thanks. Thanks so much for the question. I think, I feel like this is going in and out. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I wish I'd been able to use that stalling to come up with a great answer <laughs> to the um, great question, which is, um, you know, a, a task that smart and experienced organizers I know are also you know, really working on. And I think that my, you know, I would put my um, efforts and energies on a side that would inf um, emphasize a common name, um, that would emphasize um, an enduring project rather than multiple local projects, but a common name over, um, essentially over every, you know, over everything. And that would try to you know, use um, you know, use a, a visual vocabulary to um, yet yeah, to make everything to make it look cohesive rather than really fragmented. So I think it's more, it, and I and I think that there are groups that are um, definitely working in that direction. So on the um, on the slogans and chants thing, um, the interesting thing is like. I mean, it can get a little boring to do the same. The people united will never be defeated if you've got 400,000 people and it takes six hours to, um, to walk somewhere. So I think a kind of combination of um, maybe slight variations on you know, good, slow, you know, good old chants and then the, the familiar favorites um, can, just as a matter of not being bored, be, be helpful. Thanks. Um, I'd, I'd love, to hear, love to hear Fred talk more about the managerial mode of control because that's something that just comes up actually very minimally in the actual book. Um, but you emphasized it here in your talk and, you know, in a, in a, in a way that raised some red flags. I'm wondering uh, if you could talk more about it and also um, discuss its relation to communicative capitalism and what Jody's talking about. Are they Great. the same thing? Are they Great. different? Great. Thank you. Okay. That, that's the perfect segue. Thanks. Um, I think the managerial mode is a fusion, is, it's very close to what Jody's describing as, as communicative capitalism. It's a fusion of the kind of American post-World War II search for a polity built around individual self-fulfillment and the emergence of two other systems, one communicative, one a sort of information technology and media system that's ubiquitous, and the other is massive consumer marketplace. Um, those things have all happened together. You know, the pursuit of individuality, the pursuit of the marketplace, and the pursuit of large-scale media and information communication systems. And they, they've become integrated in lots of complicated ways. You know, when I went to grad school and was taught political economy, the focus was very much on the institutional integration of those things. I think one thing that Jody's really got her finger on here that's super important is that it's the, the institutional integration now takes place at the interpersonal level. As you engage with your Facebook, you are engaging with an institution. As you are connecting with your friends, you are building an identity that is already, sort of always already capitalist and always already mediated by firms beyond you. That's the managerial mode entirely. The best kind of management manages you without your actually knowing you're being managed. You just feel that much freer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I, I appreciate your answer. I always feel like we've got, the, that there's sort of different, um, aspects of soft power that we're talking about and um, that you're highlighting, in, in addition to, of course, giving the historical richness, um, that you're highlighting with the contemporary stuff is how the soft power, um, especially in the book, um, from cyberspace, from counterculture to cyberspace, especially there, how soft power developed um, and how things like uh, you know, interdisciplinarity and networks and self-organization actually have a, a kind of um, deeply disturbing background. Um, and that, that 
my um, emphasis on um, the kind of ways that our communicative practices are expropriated by um, capital and stimulated for capital is another um, element of a sort of similar description. Would you, would you agree with that? I would. I'd only add one other thing. I, I've, over time, so, so I've done these two books. For those who don't know my work, I've done two books. A book called uh, From Democratic Surround and From Counterculture to Cyberculture. And they're actually chron chronologically contiguous. One starts, in the, they start in the late 30s and they end in the early 90s. And one's meant to be a prequel to the other. The one thing I would disagree with, and I, I picked up very much in terms of working on those, those books, is I don't believe, I've really lost all faith in a kind of authentic reality that, pr that can then be taken over by capital. What I see instead, having studied both capitalists and, and non, is um, a world in which we are each pursuing what we think to be the right thing, grabbing at whatever tools we can within, within situations that are highly constrained. And I, 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 I've, I've lost all faith in a, in a, in a model that says, sort of shows capitalists waiting to, to prey on us. Um, they are doing that, but, but we are also offering ourselves up, and that's part of the problem. You know, please take my friend network. Please market it back to me. I mean, we're asking for that. It's not only that it's happening to us. Okay. Again? Um, Astra asked my question, so I'm making up another one. Um, so I want to ask Peter if, if you've had a similar experience to me as, a, as an immigrant, that Americans have an ideology of nature like everyone does, but there's something weird about it. And my sense is it's got to do with that, there's, that it's endless. There's always more of it. And it's always great. Uh, as an Australian, I always thought there's always more nature, there's always plenty, but it's, it's terrible that it defeats us over and over again. Uh, and the European one, I, I sense, has got a much more sense of constraint and absence and you backed up against the mountains or the sea, wherever you are. But here, I, this, this very strange ideology and, and where the, muse, the actual Museum of Natural History, you know, sort of embodies it. It's kind of endless and expansive, and, but there's something quite a, distinctive and, and strange about it. And is that your sense or do you have another? In, if you have a relatively fresh sense of it. Thank you. Um, first of all, I think it's um, uh, unfair to uh, say that there's something called the American ideology or generalized in that way. This is obviously a very rich and multicultural you know, country. Having said that, um, there's, there seems to be one theme that, you know, one of few themes that unites the country. They, and, and this we can, you know, we learn from the Republican Party. They focus on, you know, the nation and the flag um, uh, as what unite them, the, the core myth. They're talking about the core myths. Um, and uh, the nation here being then rep the representation of in national parks, in the museum, in the, the re various representations of nature, like you know, I was focusing on uh, today on Thoreau. Uh, these becomes the, the, the few unified you know, things that people have together. It's like the Thanksgiving dinner. You know, There's one of these few things that America has um, as a nation. Um, uh, so nature becomes one of, those, one of those moments when the whole nation can come together, um, I think. Um, I wanted to comment on the, the capitalism uh, debate that I just heard, I thought it was fascinating, uh, and the, the climate march. Uh, so Bill McKibben, when he was interviewed in front of the, he was one of the organizers, he said the climate march was, um, he called it uh, the world's biggest book launch. I think that was what he said. Uh, uh, on behalf of Naomi Klein's book, This Changes Everything, Climate Versus Capitalism. Uh, the book came out, is it? that day, I believe. And what that book, uh, I assume people haven't really read it yet because it just came out, um, but that book is arguing is that now we're entering a stage in which, you know, there is environmentalists or the concerned citizens that are sort of raising up um, against capitalism. Uh, that's kind of what that book kind of states. Uh, it has that Occupy Wall Street type of flavor to it. Um, so I guess my question is then, um, are, we, are we, and I guess both of you can help me untangle it, are we entering this some sort of same rhetorics as the early 70s, late 60s, in which people are sort of rejecting capitalism as a whole? Um, or is this just another, uh, you know, 
market flair. Yeah. And can I add to that question, actually? And even for those environmentalists who would say that they're rejecting capitalism, for those of us who went down on Monday to flood Wall Street to demonstrate the connection between the financial sector and the environmental crisis, are we nonetheless upholding a, um, a very sort of ideological view of the environment? So seeing your talk right after Fred's, I thought it was actually a very nice illustration of the managerial mode of control of the environment. You know, the people managing the paths and taking care of the grass are like the museum curators, kind of disavowing their authority over nature while also upholding this very, you know, romantic vision of a pure place. Um, and it, it seems to me environmentalists can do that, you know, are still sort of doing that even as they're denouncing capitalism, you know saving the earth against these forces. And, and I, I would be curious to hear your thoughts about that, too. Um, so there are a few things on the, on the table. I would say on the, um, on the managerial front, this may be, um, you know, given the way that you know, Astrid's pushing it, this might be a place where um, there's a tiny nuance of disagreement between Fred and me, because I hear would say, yes, a managerial approach to um, what can be, um, if not, um, I think control's the wrong word, but um, you know, maintained, redistributed, um, um, planned is better than um, one that says, oh no, private property and markets. And so I would be in favor of, um, approach. I don't think it makes sense to say an approach to the environment. I would say the um, climate politics that I think are becoming really interesting are ones that say, you know, that recognize that climate change is real and the repercussions of this are unequally distributed. So the only way to go forward in with any kind of, of equity or justice is to deal with this in ways that don't let the um, that don't let capitalism and its suppositions become the primary way of understanding um, our the limits are that, that, that provide the limits on how we can approach a changing climate. So I think yes to managerialism on that score. Um, and I actually love I love the way you um, pointed out. Um, or, or, or inflected Peter's discussion because it's like, yeah, there was never any romantic nature anyway. It was always being managed. It's like, yes, that's great, right? And that's really good for people who want central planning and a kind of, of political managed approach to a post-capitalist world um, capable of justly handling a changing world a climate. And I don't think it's rhetoric. I think it's the reality of the, the most extreme inequality there's been um, in over a hundred years. So um, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I say, I wouldn't say, oh, let's, oh, it's just the same rhetoric as the 70s. I would say, no, this is a response to um, 40 years of extreme inequality that became more and more visible after 2008 and that Occupy um, in our setting actually helped raise up. Um, these are really important questions and I don't think we know the answer yet. Um, so I, I'm a child of the 60s, and I'm acutely aware of the 60s failures, um, the ways in which demonstrations against Wall Street, you know, Abby Hoffman t and Jerry Rubin taking dollar bills and throwing them down um, in Wall Street had virtually no effect. Tremendous theater. Jerry Rubin went and worked on Wall Street, right? So. Yeah, right, exactly. In fact, he was one of the early <laughs> networkers. He yeah. you know, exactly promoted that, exactly. Um, I have two, two thoughts that might connect this discussion also to Ken's question. Um, the first is I want to point to a book um, by Luke Botansky called The New Spirit of Capitalism, in which he argues that, in fact, the kinds of protests that we're seeing and are to some degree each a part of are a rhythmic response within capitalism that pushes capitalism to change and then incorporate the new challenges such that the system persists. So he would argue that many, some of the things that we're doing are, are pushing capitalism in such a way that it will respond and then persist. We're sort of nudging it forward. I don't know if I'd go there. I'd probably go in a different direction. Um, I'd go tying back to Ken's point. I think the American idea of nature is not only that it's endless, but that it is a place for self-discovery and self-improvement. You know, the Puritans come along and God watches them on the land. And if they make the land work well, they're going to heaven. Um, and, and, and I think that's very important. And I think to the degree that as we protest for things like um, appropriate climate politics, we use that as an occasion to, for self-formation, self self-performance, and try to sort of do our protest in a performative idiom. We are buying deeply into an American consumerist, communicative capitalist mode, and, and that won't be effective. 
my answer would be to go back to something that Jody was saying about institutions. How do we occupy institutions? How do we push forward within them? How do we, how do we outpost inside the places that have real power? That's what I, I, th what I think we gotta do. And it's not an either or thing either. It's like in the mm -hmm. streets too. Becca? I guess I'm inviting all of you to kind of expand on that um, prescription piece a little bit. Jody gave us uh, uh, the climate movement or left climate politics a pretty clear prescription, if I recall. It was one, don't add new things, um, appropriate and occupy. Um, two, emphasize collectivity over individualism. The group is more than the sum of its parts and three, defend institutions, they provide perspectives. Um, so uh, perhaps to Peter and Fred, if you had a message to the climate movement, um, what would it be? And I'm especially interested, Peter, too, because you, you um, offered some examples of kind of bi-directional appropriation between the outside and the inside representations of nature. Where do we go from, from there? Is it just a continual back and forth and is that a bad thing necessarily? All right, thank you. Um, so where do we go? Um, this Friday, I just sent in the, um, the final version of a new book that's gonna come out on trying to answer that question that I've co-authored with um, two architects, um, Michelle Yeo Kim and Louis Hartman, called Global Design. Uh, and it deals with the problem of scale. So the global warming is on the global scale. It's on the scale which is really beyond what we can almost comprehend. And it's certainly be on the scale which is um, uh, above and beyond almost sort of, you know, the, t the touchable. So how do we bring that into a scale in which we can act on? Um, a human scale. Uh, I think that's kind of your question. And what our solution came to be is that, you know, if you want to do something with climate change, you have to bring it down to a scale in which you're able to act on. Um, that could be architecture design, that's what we are trying to, to explore in this one, but it would also be, you know, ethics. Um, so that would be one, one line of answering. The problem with that is, of course, you bring it down to a scale which um, uh, does not, you know, address the big issues. Right? So you, you bring everything down to scale. You can do some of the solar cell panels, uh, sustainable architecture design, zero house uh, buildings, et cetera, et cetera. All that is really good. Yet, um, by doing so, you don't addressing the bigger issues, say, of capitalism that Naomi Klein is telling us to do and so forth. And I think that's where the climate debate is now, is you know, a, a, the tension between what we can do and what we dream uh, of should change. So I'm really wary of making any recommendations. I'm, I'm really good at analyzing the past and really terrible at making suggestions for the future. It's why I hide out in my room writing books. Um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll offer two thoughts. The first thing is try everything. I mean, it's just that bad. This is, a, I, I, I can't think of anything since nuclear weapons maybe, and maybe even not even then, that this is threatening to what it means to be a human being on the planet as, as, as climate disruption. Um, so first try everything. The second I think is um, we could take some very practical steps. I, I used to be a journalist and I'm very aware that if you tell stories a certain way people do nothing. If you tell stories other ways they do stuff. Um, and one of the things that makes people do stuff um, out of journalism is stuff that threatens them locally. So I think if I were here in New York I would be working very hard to tell as many stories as possible about what happens when the waters come up again and who they take out. And, who, and, and then I would be leaning very hard on the institutions that are responsible for protecting people who live in those spaces to, to get stuff done and make, make the changes that, that need to be made and let them press on further up. This is what's happening in California. In California, we're, we're actually out ahead of the, the carbon standards for the nation in part because mayors are pushing the governor and the governor then is, is, is making policy. It's actually a bottom-up kind of approach. Um, and that's been, that's been pretty effective. Um, I, think that's, I think that's super important. I, 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 protests are great. Um, I think capitalism is an amorphous target. I think that um, my block getting flooded tends to get people out and about in a, in a very powerful way. And they can call out the existing structures of politics to serve them and make those changes. And I think that, that that's maybe the, the way that we connect the very local, personal solar roof practices with actual governance. Um, I think global level governance comes from local level push. 
When you were giving the example of um, California and New York, I started thinking about North Carolina. And didn't they in North Carolina have a report, a property report that said, um, oh, the um, sea levels are rising and within 30 years, this stretch of land is going to be underwater. And the state said, oh, we have to make this report illegal or change it. And they didn't want to know the story. And they were afraid that it would hurt um, property values. I'm sure I probably mangled it, but there's some, Ken, you're nodding. That's a variation of it. Yeah. It's close enough to a real yeah. story. Right. So. I guess I, when I so when I hear about the local things, it's I'm kind of want, you know think okay so there's different locals and the problems um, supersede them and the problems are political and responding to a flood that has happened is probably you know it will be necessary but what about trying to find ways to address the um, the larger structures of ownership and um, carbon emissions that are producing the floods and rendering some populations more vulnerable than others. I don't think local politics by itself can do that, right? Just kind of pushing back and saying, oh, you know, you're a bad corporation, you should get a fine. I mean, they include the fact that they're going to get fines into their regular plans. Right? That, I, 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 I think, that, I mean, I haven't, I haven't read um, Naomi Klein's book yet, it's, you know, on the, on the list, but I think it's completely exciting that now the, um, you know, that, that there's a book that's getting this kind of mainstream attention that's addressing the reality of the hold of capitalism on our political systems globally that's making it hard to address the problem, right? These are not, the, the hold of capitalism is what's preventing a viable politics from emerging, and that's why it needs to be um, addressed now. I, I, I actually agree, and I think it's again a case of try everything. I don't, I, I think we should be as attentive to the global as we are to the local. But I, but I wanna, having had a deep five-year encounter with mid-century liberalism, I wanna make a plea for it again. Um, you know, you look at Ferguson. Ferguson's a fascinating situation. Totally racist police force, totally white police force. What's the voting rate among African Americans who get to elect their sheriff? Anybody know? Less than 20%. When Jesse Jackson went down there, the whole push that he made was vote. The point there is, yeah, racism is absolutely ubiquitous and persistent, but you have a structure that if you participate in it, can actually result in a diversified police force. And what's getting in the way there um, is participation. And I, I recognize the many pressures to keep African Americans from participating in voting, particularly in, in a place like Ferguson. But that said, you go to the polls, you oust the bigoted sheriffs, and you can actually make change. That mechanism does actually exist. Um, I'm, I'm really bad with names, and maybe Paul can help me, but there's um, a couple of political scientists from Princeton. At, you remember that, you know, Larry, is it Larry Bartels and? Hacker and Pearson? Um, Hacker and Pearson, good. Not, um, anyway, they've, um, they have. And Bartels um, and, and there's others. There's a, yeah. group, there's, a, there's a literature in political science about the total non-responsiveness of elective political officials to voters. In fact, they've got really good data that say the more voters interested in, particularly voters below an economic class, right? You know, in the, you know essentially the 99%, the more they're interested in an issue, the less likely their elected um, representatives are to vote in their favor. Right, so in fact, the main, mainstream political science is saying we live in an oligarchy, it's totally non-responsive. So I, I would like to be in another time period where we, a little faith in liberal democracy might help in getting people out to vote. In fact, um, it's, it, even mainstream political science is saying that we're not in that place. I would say that Fred's comment isn't that out of step with Naomi Klein's book, which I did just review. I mean, it's not even just nostalgia for the 70s, as Peter just suggested, but actually really does evoke a kind of new New Deal, kind of return to this very, you know, um, old-fashioned almost idea of social democracy that is sustainable. So there is... I love the idea of a new New Deal. A new New Deal. That's all. That's yeah. Great. That's great. Um, I've got a question. I mean, one, one thing in uh, both of your works is, is the way that the evolution of ecology coincided with a certain vision of the market, too, and we're kind of confused and inter interwoven. Um, um, you know, 
to the history of ecology and cybernetics and the idea of this managerial mode of control kind of co-evolved with ideas of nature and visions of nature. Um, and that, you know, it was something we could kind of technocratically tweak from the sidelines. What would a vision of nature be in the kind of, you know, post-capitalist world or something like that? It, what, is it the commons or how, you know, how do we have to shift our conception of ecology? So that's a good question. So let's um, start in the spirit of this exhibition, uh, taking a look at what ecology was in the Natural History Museum here in New York. Uh, so you go to displays there, and what the displays, the, you know, the single unit family, the family of the patriarch, the female, and then the, the kids, um, you know, in animals. Uh, that's the unit um, in which Teddy Roosevelt is, you know, the patron for in that museum. Uh, and that's kind of the ideology of the museum, of that museum, the way I read it, um, read into the tooth and claw of the natural world. So if you go to all these exhibits, there are all the animals kind of display that family unit. So I guess the question you're asking me now is what would our natural museum, ideal natural history museum look like today given our challenges? Um, how would we display animals uh, today in a way that reflects our, um, our current uh, political domain? And, let me give you one example then. Um, in 1993, uh, all the world leaders gathered in Rio. Was it 1992? 92, sorry. Uh, they all gathered in Rio. They couldn't agree on anything in terms of the environment. They came from all around the world. They had all kinds of different backgrounds, uh, cultural backgrounds, political backgrounds, and uh, the, the Cold War had sort of ended, but well, of course still there in many ways. Um, so what could they agree on? Uh, and they came up with one word that they could sort of, or one platform, and that was biodiversity. Uh, so, uh, uh, and I find that to be very sort of symptomatic. The, uh, the diversity of our world could only agree on one thing, namely to protect biodiversity. So we have this clear um, connection or proximity between political, cultural, and social diversity of people meeting in Rio, and the platform they were building, namely in defense of biodiversity. And I think that, that tone is, uh, is sort of now coming more on displays in Natural History Museum. We have exhibitions with you know, a social, cultural diversity of animals in displays. So now the, the latest thing is, of course, queer animals and gay animals. Uh, and, and they have an exhibition that, that direction uh, or focusing that some animals actually like living alone and yes, there are lonely, you know, you know female animals where there are kittens and the men go away and there are men protecting their you know, kittens and the female go away and, and, and uh, uh, the, the whole sort of diversity of our social uh, culture that we endorse and I endorse uh, is now also put on nature's display. Um, uh, trying to sort of reflect the society we are living in. Uh, I guess that my sort of, uh, I'm not sure if that's going to help us in terms of climate change, but I think it's worth reflecting on the ways in which our current natural history museums do reflect our culture. Um, and we can smile at it, we can sort of say, poke a finger and say, ha ha, isn't that funny? Uh, or we can endorse it and say, yes, maybe that's what we should uh, put on display uh, when we show our kids. So when I show uh, my kids around, I say, hey, isn't that fast fascinating? Those, you know, giraffes, they are mostly gay. Uh, uh, or that, you know, that hyena over there, you know, and that's a queer hyena. And, and, uh, and we find that, you know, as, as, uh, I find that as an interesting uh, way of trying to uh, pass on values I have uh, to my family and to reflect on myself. Um, yes, thank you. What so about a sexual reproduction of bacteria, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm strangely mesmerized by a world of gay giraffes. Um, so I, I want to answer your question real succinctly in terms of intellectual history. Cybernetics was a view of the world as a system interlinked through information technologies, modeled by information technologies, and it helped spawn a view of, of ecological systems that were themselves interlinked systems of information. And so once we understood things systemically, we could act for the greater benevolence of the whole. 
in our moment, I think that information has become a kind of universal solvent. You know, because of digital media, you can do, things, things can become other things very, very rapidly. You know, a movie can be chopped up, redistributed, a story can become a movie. Things move across our platform so incredibly rapidly that the boundaries between what one thing is and what another thing is, what one thing could be and what it actually is, have, have almost dissolved or they dissolve so quickly that they cease to matter. I think that gives us an opportunity to reimagine um, the, the rights of beings other than ourselves. You know, in, in the ecological era after World War II, we developed the notion of universal human rights in part as a response to the predation, the, the, the massive racism of, of Nazi Germany. I would love to see us develop um, a post-human universal rights movement, a movement in which um, spe species other than ourselves had rights equal to our own. Now, now that would be a movement. Um, that would be pretty neat. And I think that's something that, ironically, information technology offers us as a vision. Things, other things that appeared very different actually aren't that different. Well, let's get on that and build a body of rights around it. I don't think I have a good answer to the um, nature question because I don't, I don't usually think about nature, right? I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the social and political and economic systems through which um, people affect the world and interact with the world and um, destroy it and create it and rupture it. And I think that that's where um, the focus should to, um, needs to be, is um, you know, how human systems are working in, um, in context that we also that we create and that this um, context that we create and context that we respond to and context that we um, you know, affect in ways that we can't predict. And so rather than kind of thinking about um, some kind of um, outside, I, I always, yeah, begin from our systems. And I, and I guess, I, you know, I, I know that there's, there are a lot of people who are interested in different versions of rights, you know, animal rights or, or post-human um, rights. And I keep thinking, if, 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 the, if, if it hasn't worked for humans, is that going to be the more efficacious politics? Will, will you know, populations of folks who have not been motivated around human rights, will in fact they be motivated around sort of rights of, of, of other species or of land or water, and maybe they will, right? Maybe that's a, a kind of been a, a limit. You can usually make, you can more easily make another human your enemy and want to have, let glaciers have rights. But I would think that that's a, to me, that's a kind of interesting kind of tactical sort of question rather than, um, rather than something else. And I think, so it might, I think it's worth pursuing as, yeah, maybe people are more likely to protect a glacier than they are island peoples. All right, we're going to wrap it up and give it back to Becca. Thank you. Hey, thank, you. thank you to Astra and to our panelists. You know, just one thing I wanted to reflect on when you brought up biodiversity, I thought about um, bringing it on home to this uh, idea of one here um, with this project, we we're interested in occupying the American Museum of Natural History um, in the tradition of institutional critique in the canon of art history. This is a um, space in which we can point out the gap or contradictions between the ideals of the institution and its practice, um, or the practices of its sponsors and board members. Um, but also uh, occupying institutionality as a, as a form. Um, and that uh, has to do with our last panel on counterpower um, and to your prescription, um, which is defending our institutions and, and building institutions. Um, it, it, this derives from an understanding of institutions not as monolithic. And I think the bio, uh, biodiversity example inside the American Museum of Natural History here in New York is, is a, a perfectly emblematic one, where if you have been there, the biodiversity room, um, it was, designed by a curatorial team that could not agree on anything. In fact, got to the point where they would not even sit in the same room together. They had their interns and assistants um, there negotiating. 
And rather than some kind of synthesized uh, curatorial vision, it's actually divided into three corridors. So on one side of the room is what uh, we colloquially refer to as the um, kind of ADD Hall of Biodiversity, where there's just a ton of species hanging from the ceiling and boxes, like everywhere, right? And in the middle corridor is this a very immersive um, environment of uh, forest ecosystem, and you can hear stuff, and it's moist. And then on the third side of the room is the um, biodiversity of the, the, the politics of biodiversity. I mean, that's where you see probably the most political aspect of the museum, problems and solutions and um, so on. So I, I like I like that as a metaphor and and also as an invitation, a reminder that our institutions are made up of individuals um, with competing politics and ideologies, and that um, creates a space for us. And it also calls into question what are the parameters or the boundaries of our institutions? Who gets to speak on behalf of them? Um, are they are, are they public spaces truly as um, as their, their mandates suggest, um, and if so, can we speak on behalf of them? Um, I, I would suggest we can, and I invite all of you to join us in that endeavor. Um, and we can, uh, we can do that uh, a little bit more uh, next Saturday, October 4th, um, with two panels. I'll tell you briefly about them. Um, the first at 1 p.m., Anthropocene, Capitalocene, or Ecology for All. This. Uh, starts with one of my favorite Edward Abbey quotes, a uh, big, big environmentalist and monkey wrencher, um, where he talks about capitalism as the ideology of the cancer cell, unlimited growth in a finite system. So this panel considers the violent legacies of capitalism's exploitation and appropriation of nature. It inquires into how views of natural systems as separate from human systems, political, social, and economic, may be a part of the problem we face in confronting climate change. So that's with Christian Parenti, Jason Moore, Rasmic Kuchian, and that's moderated by Liza Featherstone. Our closing panel at 3.30 next week is Counterpower for Climate Justice. To build a global climate movement, we have to address the asymmetries in the burden of responsibility and the burden of impact. This requires that we acknowledge the ways inequalities are deeply embedded in the systems that continue to produce and deny climate change, hindering our abilities to mobilize against it. So in the wake of the People's Climate March, how are climate justice activists shifting the discourse and building a movement? Um, so please join us for our final day, and it certainly won't be the end of our programming. This is just the beginning. Um, we will be around for many, many years, and um, hope that you will join us in kind of co-creating this experiment. Um, and thank you again to everybody.